Hi, welcome to notes 7.4. Uh, these notes are about similarity in right triangles. And if we draw an altitude to the hypotenuse of a right triangle, then it will divide the triangle into two triangles that are both similar to the original triangle and to each other. Now this concept's a little bit easier to understand if you can see the pictures. So here I've got a right triangle and I draw an altitude to the hypotenuse. Well, you can see that I've got two right triangles formed now. Okay, so those are my two right triangles that are formed. And you can see now, when I kind of put them together, that these two both have right angles, and then this angle is the same. And likewise, a right angle, and then this angle is the same. So what I've really got is I have angle-angle similarity. So I have three similar right triangles, and that what the, that's what they're talking about. When I drop an altitude, it forms two triangles that are similar to each other and to the bigger right triangle. So if we look that, at that in your notes, um, if the altitude is drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle, so there we go, there's the altitude, it's drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle, then the two triangles formed are similar to the original triangle and to each other. So these triangles are similar and those triangles are similar and those triangles are similar. I've formed three pairs of similar triangles. There are a couple of theorems that go along with that, and the first one is the geometric mean altitude theorem, and it simply states that in a right triangle, the altitude from the right angle to the hypotenuse divides the hypotenuse into two segments, so we've got two segments right here, and um, let me see, we've got A, B, I think this is C, and this is D. And it says the length of the altitude is the geometric mean of the lengths of the two segments. So um, BD over CD is going to equal CD over AD. That's what this theorem is saying. If you don't quite get that, there's going to be a little shortcut trick, memory aid that I'm going to teach you in just a second. So don't panic if you don't quite know what's going on. Our second geometric mean theorem deals with the ledge. And it simply states that, again, we've got a right triangle and we've got an altitude drawn that divides it into two segments. And the length of each leg of the right triangle is the geometric mean of the length of the hypotenuse and the segment of the hypotenuse that is closest to the leg. So, for example, in this triangle right here, um, if I have AB and CB, or CB, then the length that's closest, the segment that's closest to it, is going to be DB. If I'm talking about leg AC, which is what's going on here, AC is my geometric mean, then the segment closest to it is going to be AD. And I have another little memory aid for you for this one, too. So don't panic if you don't quite grasp it. All right, so here we have a right triangle, and we have an altitude drawn, and we need to identify the similar triangles. Remember that all their parts have to be in corresponding order, so this can get a little tricky because they're all oriented differently. This is how I like to do it. If it works for you, great. If you have your own method of doing it, fine by me, too. Okay, so I like to start with the big triangle, and I like to start with the hypotenuse, so FH, and then that means the right angle is G. Then I'm going to move on to my medium triangle, and my medium triangle, the hypotenuse is going to be, let me see, I went from short to long, so short to long, GH, and the right triangle is J. And then in my little, my smallest of the triangles, um, short to long would be FG, and my right angle would again be J. And that's how you can assume or assure that all of your corresponding parts are in the right order. Okay, so back when we were talking about the geometric mean theorems, I told you that I was going to give you um, some tools to basically help you remember them, so geometric mean theorems. And there were two of them. There were uh, the altitude and the leg. So let's start with our leg. The tool that we are going to use, or the method that we are going to use for our leg method is going to be called the boomerang. And remember, this one stated that the um, 
length of the leg was the geometric mean of the hypotenuse and the segment closest to that leg. So let's say, for example, this is the leg that we're talking about. I need to imagine that there's a little guy standing over here and he's got a boomerang in his hand. And you begin at the vertex that is away from the leg and he's going to throw his boomerang and his boomerang goes all the way along the triangle. So it goes all the way from A to C. And then like a good boomerang, it turns and it curves and it goes up the leg. And then like a good little boomerang, it curves and comes back. So it goes down the leg. But like any boomerang, if you've ever thrown one, unless you're like an actual aborigine, you can never get it to come all the way back to you. It only comes part way back. So it only comes back as far as CD. And that is the order in which you set up the ratio for the boomerang. So the hypotenuse, leg, leg, segment. Right? That's the boomerang method. When you're going to talk about the altitude, when it's the geometric mean altitude theorem, then we're going to use something called over, up, down, over. Not quite as fun as the boomerang method. So this time, what we're interested in is the altitude. And the altitude is the geometric mean of the lengths of the two segments. So we're going to do exactly what the name implies. We're going to come over, which gives me AD. And then we're going to go up, which gives me BD. And then we're going to turn around and come down, which gives me BD. And then we're going to go over, which gives me DC. And that is how I set up that ratio. And it doesn't matter which end you start from in this one. In this one, you must start at the vertex that is away from the leg that you are interested in. And in this method, you can start from either side. It doesn't matter because when you actually solve, you're going to come up with the same answer. I think once you see these methods in action, um, you'll realize how useful they are and how very simple they are. So let's do that. Okay, so I need to solve for x and y. Well, let's just solve for x first. So x is a leg. Leg means boomerang, right? Leg equals boomerang. So I'm going to use my boomerang method. Since my leg is over here, I'm going to start with my little guy over here at the vertex away from the leg. He's going to throw his boomerang the length of this hypotenuse. So 6 plus 2 is 8. It turns and comes up the leg, so 8 over x equals turns and comes back down x, but it only comes part way back, so x over 2. Now I'm going to cross multiply and solve. I get x squared equals 16, which means that x equals 4. Right? When I take the square root of both sides, I get x equals 4. Not so bad, right? Okay, so if I want to do y, y is an altitude. Altitude equals over, up, down, over. Udo. So I'm going to go over, 6, up, y, down, y, and over 2. The altitude is the geometric mean of the two segments. Right? That's all that's going on here. So y squared equals 12. Take the square root of both sides. And remember, we're always going to simplify our radicals. So y is going to equal 2 radical 3. Okay. Let's try this one. I'm just going to do x in this one for you. Um, and I'm only going to do it because we're starting from a different side. I think once I do this one, you'll have the hang of it. And then you guys are going to do all the rest. So um, this is my leg. Leg means boomerang. And I'm going to start my little guy with the boomerang away from, at the vertex that is on the side, away from the leg. So he's going to throw his boomerang. So he goes the length of the hypotenuse, which is 8, over the leg, x. The boomerang turns and comes back, x but it only comes part way back, 3. Cross multiply and solve. So x squared equals 24, which means that x equals 2 radical 6. Okay, I would like you guys to do all the rest of these. Um, once you have the answer to every single one, then I want you to come back and check your answers. I will have them all posted here once you've finished. So hit pause now and come back with your answers. All right, so the highlighted values are the answers that you were supposed to find. 
I'm going to give you a second to go ahead and check them. Actually, why don't you hit pause while you go ahead and check them. Okay, how would you do? If you have questions on why these are what they are, then you need to be sure to ask them in class. Uh, it could be that you just can't simplify radicals very well, or it could be that you're doing the method wrong. Uh, let's talk about this one right here, because this one gets a little complicated. Uh, to find x, we are doing the boomerang method, so we basically get 40 over x equals x over 12. Now, when you cross multiply here, you get x squared equals. You could multiply this out uh, and get a fairly large number that you would then have to reduce. I like to do something um, called prefactoring. Okay. So I know I'm going to multiply 40 times 12. And, um, and then I know I'm going to take the square root of that. Well, since I'm going to take the square root of it, I'm going to want to know what the factors are in order to simplify it. So I can factor it even more. Um, 40 is 4 times 10, which is 5 times 2. And then 12 is 4 times 3. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a pair, right? Because that's what the square root is. The square root is two of the same number that multiply together to give you a value. And so I have a pair of fours. And that's where my 4 came from, outside the radical. Because these two together, when I take the square root of 4 times 4, I get 4. And then what happens is, because I don't have a pair of anything else, I just multiply these all back together and they stay under the radical. So 5 times 2 is 10, times 3 is 30, and that's where my 30 came from. So that may be a method that is easier for you than multiplying and then doing a great big factor tree when the numbers get large. All right? When they're small, you can just take the square root and simplify it pretty easily. But when they get big, this is an easier method. All right, I would like you to solve for these variables, and I would like you to give me the answer in the notes check. So that concludes our notes for today. Be sure you go on to the notes check, and be sure you ask if you have any questions in class. Thanks.